Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New Year. We're starting off the year with episode 423. And in it, we have a bunch of news, including tail weaponry on ankylosaurs and sauropods. Yes. We also have a new ornithopod and how AI helps us with paleontology that Sabrina's going to tell me all about. Those are both Sabrina stories, so I'm excited to hear about those. <laughs> Actually, so is the sauropod tail weaponry. And you probably guess who's doing the ankylosaur tail weaponry. <laughs> we also have dinosaur of the day, Abrosaurus. And of course, I have a fun fact. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have our 10 existing patrons to thank. They are Remy Rodriguez, Lucas and Eli, Iwan, Misunderstood Overraptor, Witch Lars, Florida Fossil Hunter, Myco Raptor, Jesse, Rocco Raptor, and Amato Titan. Thank you so much for being our patrons and supporting our show. And we have something special in store for our Triceratops patrons and above because we're celebrating our eight-year anniversary of Ino Dino this month. So keep an ear out for that news. So before we get into our new news, we have an update on a older piece of news, which is quite the controversy. Mm -hmm. Maybe the biggest controversy I've seen in paleontology in years. It's pretty intense. So one of the papers about the Tanus site has been under a lot of scrutiny lately, and my guess is it will probably get retracted soon. If you're not familiar with the Tanus site, we first talked about it back in 2019 in episode 228. The lead author on that paper was Robert De Palma, who worked on the site for several years. I think it was at least four years. I think the site was actually discovered way back in 2008, and then obviously it took until 2019 for a large paper to be published on it. There were a couple of fish from it published earlier, mm -hmm. but that's not what this is about. It's an area of the Hell Creek Formation in southwest Montana, and it's called the Tana Site. It's named after the area in Egypt where the Rosetta Stone was found. Oh, and it kind of unlocks the demise of the dinosaurs. Exactly. Yeah, it was considered like a super pivotal discovery. And what's remarkable about it is it appears to be a snapshot of a tsunami or seiche caused by the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs, which is just crazy. It's a one meter thick chunk of rock and represents just a few hours to maybe days of very rapid sedimentation. So it's been called like an event deposit, <laughs> which is really cool. Yeah, a lot happened. It's full of fish, debris, and tectites. Tectites are tiny pieces of glass that solidify and rain down like hail from the sand that's vaporized during a meteorite or asteroid impact. Is that also known as glass spherules? Yes. Yeah, like the things we talked about that ended up on the moon? Yes, exactly. So uh, most of them end up on the Earth, obviously. And since this chunk of rock is full of those, we assume that it was like raining glass during the time that that rock was being formed or the stuff was sedimenting. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to rain on you. Yes. And it makes the air very, very hot with the solidification of the glass, not to mention condensation. Also, the top of the site has a layer of iridium marking the ash from the impact settling down and showing just how quickly the other layers must have formed so that at the bottom you've got all this water movement in the middle of all the tectites raining and on top you have the ash. The hypothesis is the impact created a huge earthquake which rocked the water in the area causing sloshing known as seiches and then those seiches really mixed everything up into what ended up fossilizing. And they showed this in the latest, well, maybe not the latest, but one of the recent David Attenborough documentaries, The Day the Dinosaurs Died. Yeah, it was also called Dinosaurs the Final Day in different markets. And it was very interesting. It also included details like fish getting killed by tectites and other debris getting stuck in their gills, likely suffocating them, and a turtle getting impaled. <laughs> that came out in a later paper. You had to bring up the turtle. <laughs> yeah. No sauropods in sight. There were no Just sauropods in sight. Mention. Just in general, in the Hell Creek, I don't think there were any sauropods. So, yeah, yeah. there's one just turtle death that sauropods had nothing to do there with. There are sure. more than one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that paper, which was published in PNAS, doesn't have any notes or retractions on it. 
and I don't think is under any enhanced scrutiny whatsoever. So I don't think any of those conclusions are being questioned. I think the documentary is safe. You know, I don't think there's anything in it that's like, oh no, that's not true. And we should be sad that we don't have this amazing site anymore. So it's just the latest paper that's under scrutiny. Yeah, there is a little bit of scrutiny for the earlier paper because some of the paleontologists who reviewed the paper and looked at the work were critical that they weren't allowed access to the site. And the site is on private land and De Palma reportedly paid to have exclusive access to it. So there's a little bit of controversy with it that way, but not related to the science. The new controversy comes from the second paper, which was published in Scientific Reports in 2021, also by De Palma with co-authors. That's the one where they found that the impact happened in the springtime. Yes. Yeah, the paper is titled Seasonal Calibration of the End Cretaceous Chicxulub Impact Event, and it was published in December of 2021. And we covered it, too, shortly after it was published. Yes. Their conclusion that the impact happened in the spring was mostly based on fish growth rings, insect development, and isotopic analysis. And that claim actually is not really in question, but the data backing it up is. That's because there's another group that's claiming that De Palma fabricated the data to beat them to publication. Yep, very controversial. Melanie During had been working on a paper with Robert De Palma, and she was listed as the first author, and he was reportedly going to be the second author. The paper titled, quote, The Mesozoic Terminated in Boreal Spring was submitted to Nature in June 2021. They used histology on fish bones and isotope analysis. Sound familiar? One of their conclusions was that the animals in the Southern Hemisphere were in better shape to survive the impact, and that's because they were preparing for winter, because even though it was spring in the North, in the Southern Hemisphere, it was the autumn, so some of them were getting ready for that long winter. And that's arguably why they fared a little better. Yeah, because we think a lot of the early dinosaurs were in the Southern Hemisphere. Some of the animals might have even already been hibernating in burrows, basically the closest thing animals can do to hiding in a bunker. So that's obviously pretty helpful. Yeah. <laughs> if you could sleep for four months, the first four months of all the fireballs and floods and earthquakes and falling trees and all that stuff. Can you imagine waking up though? Yeah, that would be what pretty scary. What that feels like, yeah. <laughs> we actually didn't cover this paper because it was so similar to the De Palma paper and we even discussed it off the air at the time and we're a little bit confused why such a similar paper was published so closely after the other one. I didn't even realize they were two different papers at first. Yeah, we were just like, why is this? We just reported on this. I don't understand. So we just skipped it. Despite being submitted in June 2021, During et al.'s paper wasn't published until February 2022, and De Palma is not listed as a co-author on that paper when it finally went to publication. And that's not really that long of a length of time for publication review and all that stuff. That's like seven months. Anywhere up to a year is pretty normal. De Palma submitted his paper two months later in August of 2021 to Scientific Reports, another nature journal. And it was published in December 2021, so it was a little faster. Different journals can review things faster or slower, depending. I think Nature is one of the ones that takes a little bit longer because they're just a lot more curated and they get way more submissions, whereas Scientific Reports is open access. I think they publish more, and so I think their turnaround is a little bit faster. According to a comment posted in December 2022 by During It All, quote, there are a number of concerning anomalies regarding the isotope analysis presented by De Palma et al. Primary data are not provided, the lab where the analyses were performed is not specified, and the methods are insufficiently described, end quote, which sort of summarizes the complaints of the data in the paper. Getting a little more detailed into it, they said, quote, furthermore, isotopic graphs for carbon and oxygen contain anomalies parentheses, missing data points, double data points, identical length error bars for both elements despite different scales, and parentheses, that are inconsistent with genuine machine outputs, end quote. And I reviewed all the data too because I'm pretty familiar with these types of analyses, and I agree. All the things that they presented in that paper do have lots of weird data points and weird error bars and it looks pretty strange. 
They also said, quote, some graphs supposedly derived from the fossil specimens match perfectly when overlaid on each other, while others do so when one is stretched to 150% or compressed to 70% of original length. Since these observations are uncharacteristic for genuine biological data, we are compelled to ask whether the data may be fabricated, created to fit an already known conclusion, end quote. That's some spicy language. <laughs> it is. And yeah, so basically they're saying we worked together with De Palma on a different paper and came to all these conclusions and we have all the data in our paper. And then in order to publish it quickly, data was fabricated in order to back up a different paper that could get published faster with mm. De Palma as the lead author. The authors say they asked the editors of scientific reports to investigate and get raw data within a few weeks of De Palma's paper being published because they didn't believe that there was raw data behind it. And in November of 2022, the scientific reports editors shared the data with During et al. And it seems to have only confirmed their suspicions. They said, quote, the data consisted of low resolution photographs on wrinkled printouts with no time and date stamps and illegible numbers and graphs with no values on the axes. Very unexpected data for a modern mass spectrometer, end quote. And that is definitely unusual to have an actual printout. This stuff is usually done digitally now. And the paper, the one result that they have in the actual paper on nature is a digital one with much clearer things <laughs> on it. So it's kind of unusual that they don't match. They also said the data that was shared also seems to be incomplete. Quote, if De Palma's statement about replicate samples is true, there are only four fossil fish Note the paper speaks quite explicitly about 19 individual fish, not 19 samples, end quote. So in other words, there's still a lot of missing data, it appears, even after getting what should have been the raw data from De Palma. As a result, the most recent De Palma article on Nature has an editor's note from December of 2022 saying, quote, Readers are alerted that the reliability of data presented in this manuscript is currently in question. Appropriate editorial action will be taken once this matter is resolved, end quote. Oh, I see. That's why you think it might be taken down. I do. We saw the same sort of comment on the Ubi Rajara mm -hmm. paper before it got taken down, and it's basically under investigation. But from what I've seen on Twitter and in other comments elsewhere, it seems like most people agree that the, the data looks a little bit questionable. So I am guessing that it will end up getting taken down, especially considering there's already another paper that basically has all the same information in it. It's not really losing too much from the scientific knowledge by taking the paper down. De Palma has responded to science saying, quote, we absolutely would not and have not ever fabricated data and or samples to fit this or another team's results, end quote. And he said that the raw data are missing because the scientist who ran the analyses died years prior to the paper's publication. So it's obviously possible that that's why the data is missing. But I don't know if that's a reason to not take down the study, because if you don't have the data to back up your science, it doesn't really matter why. But if you can't prove your conclusions, then it's hard to keep that published. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I don't see anything, again, that's going to show that the study was inaccurate because it is such an amazing conclusion that they figured out what season this seemed to have happened in. And obviously, they already made that really cool David Attenborough documentary. So it would be a shame if all of that turned out to be wrong. But it doesn't seem like it. So that's nice. This is a silver lining. That poor turtle really did get speared. Yeah, seems that way. <laughs> so there's a big controversy. Starting it off on a, a high note. <laughs> yeah, well, this did technically happen last year. Well, on to some happier news. A new dinosaur. We're catching up still from the end of 2022. There were, it seemed like a slew of new dinosaur <laughs> papers that came out. That seems to happen every year. Yeah, that's <laughs> we're, true. We're getting a little bit ahead on episodes so we can take a week off around New Year's and then a whole bunch of dinosaur discoveries happen in the meantime. Even if we didn't take time off, we wouldn't have been able to do all of them. Oh yeah, because we also have SVP coverage for the, the month of November, basically. Yes. That's kind of how we fell behind. <laughs> and then there were also a, a lot of new dinosaurs that came out in December. Yeah. 
Anyway, this one's a new dwarf rhabdontid dinosaur, Transylvanosaurus platycephalus. Platycephalus. Yeah, it's a fun name. Mm-hmm. The species name platycephalus means wide head. And then Transylvanosaurus means lizard from across the forest. It refers to Transylvania, and that's the historical region where the fossil was found. I didn't realize that Transylvania referred to across a forest. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. So this paper was published by Felix Augustin and others in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. The fact that it's got a wide head and in some papers it was called a flat head reminded me of The Land Before Time when Sarah says to Littlefoot, you've got a nice flat head, flat head. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if Transylvanosaurus platycephalus is the one with the flat head, well, then Sarah is wrong. And the nickname flat head should go to this new dinosaur, not Littlefoot. I guess so. Yeah, I guess sauropods and Littlefoot did not have that flat of a head, but compared to the big frill and big pointy horns that ceratopsians have, almost everything's a flat head. Yeah. <laughs> so the holotype of Transylvanosaurus is a fragmentary skull. It includes the front of the skull, the frontal, and the basocranium, the lower back of the skull. And the front of the skull is what was very wide. That's one of its unique features. And it's wider than other rhabdodontids. The fossils were found in sediments of an ancient riverbed. They were found back in 2007, and they've now been digitized. There were no additional skull bones or remains found between the frontal and basocraniums. So that may mean that there were some soft tissue still connected to the bones when the individual was buried. Oh, in other words, it hadn't fully fused. No, it's not bones. It's just soft tissues in between these bones, and that's why we didn't find anything in between the bones. Yeah, yeah. So that happens on a lot of skulls before they fuse. As you get older, there's soft tissue, like connective tissue, cartilage and stuff Mm. in between the plates on the head, although not every bone ends up fusing. So I guess that's another question. Yeah, it's unclear. There are some additional fossils that might be referred to Transylvania source in the future, That includes this conjoined pair of frontals, but they weren't referred in this paper. So maybe in future papers, we'll know a little bit more about this dinosaur. Transylvaniosaurus lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now the Hatseg Basin in Romania. And rhabdodontins are the most common medium-sized herbivores in the late Cretaceous in what is now Europe. They're especially abundant in the Hatseg Basin, and we talked all about the dinosaurs of the Hatseg in episode 400. Well, except for Transylvania source, because this one's new. (laughs) Yeah. It was described as a small to medium-sized dinosaur. The paper didn't specify, but I did see in some news outlet that said it was six and a half feet or two meters long. I'm not sure where those numbers came from. Hmm. Maybe a different rhabdodon did, like rhabdodon. Maybe, or maybe the authors said it somewhere. I'm not sure. Now, as a rhabdodontid, It would have walked on two legs, it would have had a long skull and a long tail, a somewhat bulky body, and been herbivorous. And again, these are all generalizations because we just have the two skull bones. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to know much about the body when you only have the head. Yeah. It appears to be more closely related to rhabdodontins found in what is now France compared to rhabdodontins found in what is now Romania. Oh, weird. Yeah. Especially considering it was an island. Yeah. Well, it might mean that the lineages of rhabdodontids are just more complex than we previously thought. Like how they spread out to different parts of Europe is just more complicated than what we used to think. Because we used to think that there were two distinct geographically separated lineages in the eastern and western parts of the string of islands in the late Cretaceous and what is now Europe. But now that doesn't appear to be the case because it, this Transylvaniosaurus looks a lot like Um, relative that was kind of far away. (laughs) Yeah, on a different island. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's interesting. I guess if you're a rhabdodontid in the late Cretaceous, the Hatag Island was the place to be. Yeah. It's got a lot of rhabdodontid diversity. (laughs) Just watch out for those pterosaurs. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Hatagopteryx is coming to scoop you up and eat you. All right, we're going to get into our big tail weaponry discussion in just a bit but first we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break all right so since we're talking tail weaponry i'm starting with ankylosaurus because they always go first when you're talking about tail weapons. they don't always 
<laughs> I think they should. Mm. Sauropods have cool tails and all, but they're they're not as weapony. <laughs> mm. They're just different. It's yeah. a different kind of weapon. Yeah. So this new paper was written by Victoria Arbor in Biology Letters. Victoria Arbor is the name I always like to see when it's an ankylosaur paper because she's the one that seems to know it all. And since we're talking about a couple tail weaponry paper, I think it's worth mentioning that tail weapons are very uncommon in both living and extinct animals. Usually with weapons, they're on the heads or hands, things that you would look at in front of you so you can kind of see where you're aiming. <laughs> it's the normal way to have weapons. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of exceptions, and Victoria in previous papers has pointed out that armored or big bulky animals that are sort of stiff in the middle sometimes end up developing tail weapons. Couldn't If you had a tail weapon, couldn't you, in theory, turn your head to see what you're swinging your tail at? Maybe. It sort of depends on the animal. A lot of the animals that have tail weapons don't have that good of sight. Hmm. It's another thing that they sometimes have in common. And you don't usually get the binocular vision if you're going to try to turn your head because you can't turn your head far enough to get both eyes pointed backwards. So it makes it a lot harder to get that depth perception for aiming. Hmm. So yeah, it's it's definitely not the ideal place to have weapons. Although the one nice thing about it is it makes it harder for stuff to sneak up behind you which is a pretty good advantage. We know from previous research that Ankylosaurus and Zool could swing their tail hard enough to break the foot of a Tyrannosaur. They just have to actually hit the foot. They do. And the reason I say the foot is because I think there was another study that said it could break the leg, but then there was a study looking at what the ideal place to swing at was, and they came up with the foot because it has less cushioning around it to sort of lessen the blow and it would have been more damaging overall to the dinosaur. I thought you were going to say because that's what they could reach. Yeah, that helps too because <laughs> some of those legs were very high up. So even though it looks like they could have swung their tail weapons hard enough in order to defend themselves pretty successfully, this new study proposes that their tail weapons were primarily for fighting each other and not defending themselves. Ouch. If it could break the foot of a tyrannosaur, what did they do to each other? Yeah, that is a good question. And I think it also sort of negates a little bit my point when I was talking about how ankylosaurs are the best dinosaurs because they never mess with anybody and they just sort of keep to themselves. They didn't. They mess with each other. And yeah. maybe turtles. Imagine the smashing they could do with those tails. But remember, this is them intraspecific fighting. So why, why are you getting but turtles they, involved? Because if they couldn't see what they were <laughs> swinging their tails at, the turtles might have gotten in the way but and been smashed. Yes, that is theoretically possible. Yeah. But unlikely. Just as bad, if not worse, <laughs> than the sauropods accidentally crushing them because they couldn't see them and they were just walking. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so all of these conclusions comes courtesy of the amazing Zool discovery which we had a chance to see a few years ago up at the ROM in Canada. We haven't talked about Zool in a while, so I think it's worth re-describing. He so <laughs> just cool. wanted an excuse to talk about Zool. It's such a cool dinosaur. So it was discovered back in 2017. And yeah, it's been like five years. It's worth a recap. I think Zool has popped up in various ankylosaur papers now and again. Yeah, but it's still worth talking about. Yeah. So Zool was actually found back in 2014 in northern Montana. And it was found while removing rock from above a possible Gorgosaurus. They were trying to get down to a Tyrannosaur because that's where all the money is. And they ran into the club of an Ankylosaur. Good thing the Ankylosaur had long since fossilized. You wouldn't want to run into the club of an alive <laughs> Ankylosaur. That's true. <laughs> I think it's also good that they ran into the club because it's such a sturdy chunk mm -hmm. that, you know, if you ran into the skull or some more fragile bone, you might do a lot of damage or might not even notice it, but the club is pretty unmistakable. It turned out to be in extremely good shape since none of it had eroded out. Like it's sort of the ideal thing, even better than having the tip of it sticking out of the rock is having none of it sticking out of the rock and, you know, discovering it mid rock. Right. Yeah. Nothing was weathered. Yes. And it includes basically the whole animal. There was a unofficial listing I saw where it was called 99% complete. Wow. Which would make it by far the most complete ankylosaur 
id, you know, like an ankylosaur of like a reasonable size with a tail club. Maybe the, one of the most complete dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about big dinosaurs, because there are all those little tiny like microraptor side stuff that's True. basically 100% complete. But this one includes both ends of it. So it has a very good skull. Its left eye is the good side, <laughs> I would say, including the bony eyelid and pair of horns above and below the eye, sort of on the back of the head. Hmm. So if you're photographing it, make sure to get its left side. Yes. All the pictures are of the left side, pretty much. You have to look <laughs> at like a paper or something to find its right side. And again, the find includes basically the whole animal from beak to tail club, which is really rare. We usually find the skulls. We don't usually find the body and the tail clubs are also pretty rare. But it's especially relevant for this study that they found a large set of osteoderms preserved in place as it was when it was alive. It sort of got pancaked, but they're all lined up like as you go from the front to the back. You can see that these were the osteoderms in the front, these were the middle, and there's even like skin and keratin and all sorts of really amazing stuff over the top of it. You might have also seen Victoria Arbor tweeted recently flipping the Zool jacket during the research. Did you see that cool no, thing? No, I didn't. So they have it in this like big cage looking thing and they're turning it over. And at first that block initially weighed over 15 tons. <laughs> it's maybe the heaviest block of dinosaur I've ever heard of. We, I know that Utah Raptor block is 10 tons. I think it's nine tons. Yeah. We hear about like, you know, five to six tons or a couple tons getting airlifted down mm -hmm. then, but 15 tons is just another level. But by the time it was flipped, I think it was only down to like five tons. So, you know, much more reasonable. Yeah. It's a piece of cake to flip. <laughs> they had to flip it over because all those osteoderms were on the top the way it fossilized. So that's what they worked on and prepped out first and have described before. And then they wanted to get at all the bones that were underneath, like the hips and stuff that are preserved underneath all those osteoderms in place, mm -hmm. still protected <laughs> millions of years after it got fossilized. And so they had to flip it over. Flip that pancake. Yeah, it's true. It's the difficult flip. Zula is probably the second largest ankylosaur that's ever been found. It's estimated at about six meters or 20 feet long and about five tons. The largest, of course, is Ankylosaurus at eight meters or 26 feet and weighing over eight tons. Just got to throw that in there. Of course. <laughs> but Zool is definitely more complete. And again, yeah, they're saying maybe it's 99% complete in unofficial places. It's definitely a really beautiful discovery. If it's ever on display near you, I highly recommend going and checking it out. But back to the current study. So several of Zool's osteoderms are damaged and or partially healed around the hips. There are a total of five damaged osteoderms, three on one side and two on the other. They're all right next to each other above the hips too. So they're very concentrated because there are tons of osteoderms on this thing. It's not like it's five out of 10. It's like five out of 100. Mm -hmm. So and what happened to these osteoderms? Yeah. And why is it those specific osteoderms? Because if it was using its osteoderms just for defense from predators, we would probably expect them to be a little more randomly distributed around the body. So the idea is that Zool and other ankylosaurs fought tail first, bashing each other in their midsections and breaking osteoderms in the process. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. It's really intense. <laughs> they had this video game at the Zool display at the ROM. And I think it, was, it went on tour with Zool as well, where you got to fight other dinosaurs. And the last one was you fought another Zool. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you did. You backed up towards each other and bashed each other. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Because Victoria has been thinking this was the case since way back then. And I think even presented on it, but we weren't allowed to talk about it. It was embargoed. Mm. And now finally has dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's on the analysis because they basically went through all the osteoderms on the entire back of this animal mm -hmm. and then quantified, is this one damaged? How did it get damaged? It, was it damaged during preparation? Is it deformed because of taphonomy or did something happen while it was alive? And that was obviously a ton of work and required a bunch more preparation. And is hard to figure out. Yes. Just knowing like, yeah, was this taphonomy or something that happened in real life is yeah, really hard to figure out. You really have to know what you're looking at because they have all these pictures in the supplemental material that I went through. And I was like, oh, that's, yes, I can tell what's happening here. <laughs> it was a good <laughs> thing they all had descriptions to, to talk me through the process. So it definitely sounds weird that they like 
took up positions next to each other and always bashed them in the same spots. Mm -hmm. But they pointed out in the paper that, quote, animals with sexually selected weaponry often have highly ritualized intraspecific combat behaviors with repeated patterns of body alignment, end quote. So it's mating season. It's time to go through this ritual. Yeah. It actually kind of reminds me of male humans <laughs> sometimes <laughs> when competing for a female's attention. They back up into each other and bash each other's tails. No, it's more like they box, right? Sometimes oh. you see guys like fighting, like fist fighting. And if you were thinking about it, like, it's not the most effective way to fight, right? Mm -hmm. The most effective way to fight is usually like tackling or at least the, the person with less reach should tackle the other person to get rid of that advantage of the arm reach. But the the display is the punching mm -hmm. and you want to look like you're powerful. And, the you know, so there's like a whole ritual to how men fight when they're trying to show off. Kind of, but it's not the same because it's not like every single human does this. I don't know. That's what I've always seen. Hmm. I don't see a lot of tackling. You don't see people like kicking each other all that much or anything. It's like, it tends to be boxing. That's how people do the display. That's our, our cultural norm for fighting. Maybe in America. But I was thinking in terms of, all right, it's a specific time of year and we're going to do this in oh, this way. They weren't talking about specific times of year. They were saying that when they fight, they line up their bodies in a specific way, and then they always battle sort of the same way. Oh, okay. So it's not that it's this ritual. It's just this is what they do. Well, it's, it is ritualized in the, the behavior, but not necessarily in the timing. Okay. Although it could have been in the timing too, because yeah, you're right. We do know that dinosaurs made it at certain seasons. So yeah, it was probably the case that they would do these displays and fight for a mate <laughs> at a specific time too. That's true. So of those osteoderms that are broken above the hips, they're at different stages of healing, including some that are completely healed. And they range from having sort of the keratin broken off to being broken all the way down to the bone in the osteoderm. And then some are deformed from being, you know, rehealed in sort of a funny way. That shows you that this happened multiple times. Yeah. They did say that it's possible that it happened because some of them got infected. So it could have been one event and some of them were just slowed on the healing side because of infection. But you're right. The most likely thing by far is that it was happening multiple times. There is more evidence than just the location of the broken osteoderms that they were battling each other and it wasn't damaged due to something else. For one, it appears that younger ankylosaurs have smaller clubs than you'd expect for their size, and especially if they're using it for defense. So in other words, as they grow up, the club stays pretty small, and then all of a sudden, like, bam, <laughs> it's a big old club. And that's the kind of thing you usually see when you have sexual selection structures. Usually they grow later in life. Mm -hmm. Like you think about deer or something, the young ones don't have antlers, and they hit a certain age, and they have these huge antlers yep. one season. Puberty hits quick. Yes. There's also a lot of variability in club size and shape between different species of ankylosaurs, just like you see with different antlers. You know, some of them have antlers that stick way out to the side. Some of them are really tall. Same thing with clubs. Some of them are very wide and pointy. Other ones are more long and sort of streamlined, I guess. And maybe most notable is that ankylosaurs without tail clubs don't seem to have the same injuries above their pelvis because hmm. they didn't have that club to bash into each other with potentially. There's another interesting point. The size of the tail club doesn't seem to correlate with the size of the largest predators in the area. For example, despite Ankylosaurus being huge, the biggest Ankylosaur we know, and living alongside T-Rex, the biggest carnivore we know, mm -hmm. its tail club wasn't even close to the biggest. Anodontosaurus had a much bigger and more impressive tail club, and it was like spiky and wide and really awesome looking. So that shows you that these tail clubs aren't necessarily primarily for defense. Exactly. In addition, large predators predate any tail clubs or even stiff tails in ankylosaurs. And once the tail clubs evolved, they didn't increase in size over geological time either, although our record of that is pretty spotty, so it's kind of hard to know for sure. And speaking of tyrannosaurs, they probably wouldn't attack the hips from the side, which is where the broken osteoderms are. Since they're much taller than ankylosaurs, they'd probably either be injuring random osteoderms higher on the back, you know, like the top of the back, mm -hmm. probably not near the tail, but 
another likely place is that they would be going for the neck because yeah. that's the most vulnerable spot. Go for the soft spots that have the least amount of armor. Yes, exactly. Even the head is a lot easier to get through than these huge spiky osteoderms near the, the hips. But I think possibly the best evidence against needing a tail club to defend themselves is the existence of notosaurids because those tail clubless ankylosaurs lived alongside their club having ankylosaurid cousins right up until dinosaurs went extinct. Hmm. And that includes Denversaurus, which lived right alongside Ankylosaurus and T-Rex. So if Ankylosaurus needed its tail to defend itself against T-Rex, how did Denversaurus ever survive basically having the same body without a tail club? Maybe it was a hider. <laughs> yeah, it burrowed <laughs> with its huge <laughs> spiky body. Could be. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was the mammal strategy. Yeah. We were the ones busy hiding. Well, mammals were a lot smaller. Yeah. They do say, quote, there is little doubt that the tail club could have been used in defense when needed, but our results suggest that sexual selection drove the evolution of this impressive weapon, end quote. It would be really interesting to find another Zool specimen that didn't have a tail club or had a much smaller tail club, and we could say, ah, sexual dimorphism. Yeah, that's exactly what my fun fact is about. Oh. You went the same exact place that I did after reading this paper. <laughs> 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 but I, I would say with your favorite expression, why not both? Yeah. I think it applies here. You could use that tail club for both defense and for sexual selection. Sure. Maybe the primary reason to have it is to attract mates or, you know, fight for a mate. But why not use it for defense when you need to? Yeah, exactly. It might have even deterred some predators just seeing it. Yeah. And there might have been a little bit of influence for the the size and shape of the tail club as a defense weapon because like Victoria Arbor was saying in the paper too, there might be a maximum size of tail club that's useful for defense. Mm -hmm. So that might be why they didn't just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger over geological time. It would be so heavy, it would weigh you down. Yeah, and it gets harder to swing. And so there's like an optimum for what you can swing fast versus having that big impact and that kind of stuff. So yeah, there are probably multiple pressures on it, but it seems like, at least according to this paper, the primary driving force was impressing mates and winning battles with other Zool, not necessarily breaking shins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wonder if they're regretting that species name. Should have made it like... Nah, <laughs> still a cool name. Champion of the displays rather than destroyer of shins. <laughs> Next ankylosaur. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now that we've got the ankylosaur weaponry out of the way, we can move on to the real event. <laughs> the sauropods, <laughs> specifically the diplodocids or diplodocids. They did have some really cool tails. They did. Well, when we talk about the tails of diplodocids, we usually talk about the whip-like tails and how that meant that they could crack those tails and make very loud sounds. One study proposed that a hypothetical structure like skin and keratin attached to the end of a tail think like the tuft at the end of a bullwhip, <laughs> could move faster than the speed of sound and make a small supersonic boom, which would be so cool. But it turns out that's not the case. And that's according to a new study by Simone Conti and others, and this was published in Scientific Reports. Intrigue. Yes. If the tail did move fast enough to create a supersonic boom, and that would be at 340 meters per second, turns out that that tail would break. Yeah, it does seem like a lot of stress on the joints breaking yeah. the sound barrier, especially that jerk at the end. Yeah. Like speeding up kind of sounds maybe plausible, but stopping and whipping back and forth, oof. Mm-hmm. Yep, that whip. So the team made 3D models of tails to simulate this motion and exactly see if it could bear the stress of moving so fast. The model also simulated soft tissue resistance to stress on the skin, tendons, and ligaments when things are moving so fast. And they found that the skin gets really brittle at high strain rates. The tendons and ligaments do a little better, but they also eventually deform and they get more stiff as the tissue matures or as the animal ages. No complete diplodocid tail has been found yet, 
but a <laughs> lot of partial tails have been found. And diplodocids, they had tails that had about 80 vertebrae. <laughs> yeah, more vertebrae in their tail than we do in our whole bodies. But yeah. It's like a lot. And those vertebrae gradually decreased in size, so it got smaller at the tip. Makes sense. Be yeah. weird if it got big. Oh, I guess that's what ankylosaurs they got. They had yeah. big, heavy tips to their tails. You're right. That is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I like weird things. <laughs> and they base their simulations on the thickness of crocodile skin because no fossilized skin from a diplodocid tail has been found, or at least enough to tell us how thick it, the skin was. Hmm. They tested three types of tails with different structures at the end of the tail made of skin, tendon, keratin, keratinous filaments. So one had three segments of skin and keratin, another had braided keratin filaments, and the third had a flail-like structure. That's that medieval weapon with a striking head attached to a handle by a rope or a chain. Yeah, it's sort of like a, a whole bunch of mini whips, mm. like like a foot or a couple of feet long. Kind of, uh, except it's got that big weapon attached to it so it's like you're you can fling it oh like a mace oh i guess a mace can be on a string or a chain so yeah so the tails yeah they couldn't move faster than the speed of sound but they could still move really fast about 30 meters per second or 100 kilometers per hour oh yeah so that's like 60 miles an hour Mm -hmm. that is still a good speed (laughs) yes You'd notice if that was going flying by your head, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's probable they still use their tails for defense. They just didn't make a supersonic boom. Mm-hmm. They also found that the tails were stiffer than we previously thought. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because a lot of those, even walking with dinosaurs and stuff, they show the tails just sort of like swooshing mm-hmm. back and forth, all crazy, almost like a ribbon blowing in the breeze sort of <laughs> level of movement. <laughs> Yeah, but maybe that wasn't the case. It's still another one of these cases of which model is the most accurate because it, there's so many pieces you have to fill in. Like, is alligator skin the best skin to use or should we use a different kind of skin? How much cartilage do you put in between the vertebrae? How strong are these tendons? All that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And when we don't have really good fossil evidence, it all just comes down to different people's ideas of what the best model is. Yeah, especially when you have to use other animals to help with your model, like how they use the crocodile skin. Yeah. I personally definitely lean the tails probably weren't breaking the sound barrier, (laughs) at least not the bulk of the tail. I could see, and I kind of wonder, I'm a little bit surprised I didn't do this because you talked about a bullwhip. Mm -hmm. Bullwhips have basically a little feather on the end of them. Mm. And we know that dinosaurs probably had a common ancestor that had feathers. It could have a little tuft of feather (laughs) on the end of its tail. (laughs) Like somehow some sauropods kept feathers, but only at the end of their tails. I mean, it would be a useful place to have it if you could get a crack (laughs) sound out of it. Because you only need a tiny thing to go faster than the speed of sound. You don't need the whole tail. You don't even need the tip of the tail. If you can stick a feather off the end of it and just get the end of that feather to go faster than the speed of sound with a little flick at the end. (laughs) I'd like to see that paleo art. That would would be cool. (laughs) (laughs) But it's probably because we've never seen a feather fossilized with a sauropod. Yeah. So then there's nothing to back up this idea. Yeah. It's good to have some backup when you're peer reviewing papers. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. Garrett mentioned we talk about AI at the beginning of the show. And AI actually helped solve the mystery of some dinosaur tracks in Queensland, Australia. Hmm. This was by Jens Lowensack and others and published in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface. Now, I want to start by saying there's a lot of value in fossil tracks, but sometimes it's really hard to know what type of animal made those tracks. Oh, yeah. Like, we almost never know exactly what type of dinosaur left a footprint, but in some cases, it's even hard to tell the difference between theropod and ornithischian tracks. Yep. Yep. Because they both have three toes. So you look at stuff like maybe this toe is a little bit longer than (laughs) that toe, or maybe there's a little more of a claw on this track. So maybe that's a theropod. Exactly. And ornithischian tracks, they tend to be wider and more symmetric, and then they have blunt hoof marks instead of sharp claw marks. But these characters can be seen in both groups. Yeah. 
adding to the confusion. Yeah, because not as we know with therizinosaurs, sometimes herbivores have massive claws too, <laughs> although that's also a theropod. Yeah. So maybe that reinforces your point. <laughs> <laughs> So we're talking about the trackway from the Lark Quarry in Queensland, Australia, the Dinosaur Stampede National Monument. Nice. We almost went there, but it is quite off the beaten path. Well, we saw the exhibit at the Australian Age of Dinosaurs. Oh, that's true. They brought a little bit of it to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and they had their statues. Yeah. Now the team, they wanted to figure out which track belonged to which group, theropod or ornithischian. And to do that, they trained an artificial neural network to categorize footprints. They used about 1,500 dinosaur footprints, these were known ornithischian and theropod examples, to train the neural network. And then they tested to see how well it worked on a set of 36 tracks. They were a mix of obvious and challenging tracks to figure out. Hmm. In addition to the AI looking at it, they asked five researchers to look at the tracks and identify them. And the AI did better at figuring out which tracks were which. How did they, if the experts were coming up with a different thing, how did they know what the real answer was? It's a good question. I guess maybe they knew, oh, I, I know how you could do it. If you have a whole bunch of tracks in a row and you just pick out a really bad one, but right next to it are lined up with ones that seem pretty clearly an ornithopod or a theropod, that could be a way to do it. These were tracks that were in literature already, so they'd been validated by other people. Okay. I believe. That's pretty good that the AI managed to beat the experts. Yeah, it had a margin error of about 11%, so it classified 67% of the tracks correctly, 22% <laughs> it said was ambiguous, and then it was just wrong on 11%. Okay, so still not a slam dunk. <laughs> no. The human experts averaged 57% correctly, and then 24% were ambiguous, and then they were wrong with 20% of them. Okay. So the humans were more confident <laughs> in that they put their money down more often when they shouldn't have. I guess that's one way of looking at it. But overall, they were off by less than 10% in terms of ones that they were able to correctly identify. It was 50-something versus 60-something. Yeah, 67 AI, 57 humans. So then the team used the AI to identify the trackway in the Lark Quarry the Dinosaur Stampede National Monument. Again, it's been controversial in the past as to whether the tracks are from theropods or ornithischians. There's big tracks surrounded by a lot of small footprints, so we used to think that there was a predator that sparked a stampede, mm -hmm. and possibly Australovenidar, which I believe is what the exhibit shows at yep. the Australian Age of Dinosaurs. Yeah, they've got a big Australovenator sort of floating because they have it up. Like you do a little walkway and they have these big pedestals. Yeah. And then the tracks and stuff. And then in front of that, they've got a whole bunch of little Ornithischians scampering around. Yeah, but it turns out they might need to update this exhibit. Oh, no. And the name because it's Dinosaur Stampede. <laughs> That's true. Well, maybe it's still a stampede. I don't know. But the AI found that the tracks were made by an Ornithischian not a theropod. Then it's like the dinosaur nursery. You've got the big mama <laughs> ornithischian and a whole bunch of little babies running around in front of it. Yeah. Or maybe the the big ornithischian scared all the babies too and they're still stampeding. Yeah. Or it's being an opportunistic carnivore. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> probably not. Probably not. It's probably an herbivore. Yeah. Yeah. It's just really interesting how we can apply AI in these different ways. The team was saying they were stuck at one point. Like, you know, we, they just didn't know how to test it next to figure out if this were theropod or ornithischian tracks. And then with neural networks, machine learning, we were able to get there. That's cool. Seems like a really good use of AI. All those things where it's sort of quantifying subtle differences in things machine learning can be good for because it can find little features that we don't notice, but might be really useful in categorizing things. Mm -hmm. And in just a moment, we'll get into our dinosaur of the day. But real quick, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Abrasaurus, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a macronarian sauropod that lived in the Middle Jurassic in what is now Sichuan Province, China. 
in the lower Shashi Meow Formation. It probably looked like other sauropods, but maybe a bit more stout. And that's according to paleo art I saw. It had a long neck, a long tail, walked on four legs. And the reason I say it probably looked like other sauropods is because only the skull has been described. Hmm. It did, however, have a more boxy head with a tall bony arch on top in front of the eyes where the nostrils were. It's estimated to be about 30 feet or 9.1 meters long. <laughs> Based on a skull. <laughs> yeah. And the type species is Abrasaurus dongpoi. The genus name means delicate lizard. And that refers to the skull that had large openings separated by thin bones. The species name is in honor of the poet Su Shi, a.k.a. Su Dongpo, who was born in Sichuan and lived from 1037 to 1101. So a little while ago. <laughs> yeah. Not, not as long ago as Abrasaurus, though. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. <laughs> <laughs> thousand years sounds like a long time until you think in geology terms and then it's basically right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fossils were discovered in 1984 and then first described in 1986. And they were described by Ouyang Hui as Abrasaurus gigantorhinus. Did it have a big nose? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know. Well, that's what gigantorhinus oh, I guess, would mean. <laughs> I guess it had the large opening. The boxy head, I guess you could say, like the boxiness of the front is sort of like a big nose. Yeah. He described this in his thesis, but the thesis didn't meet ICZN standards, so that name is a nomum nudum. Then Hui, in 1989, formally described Abrasaurus and named it Abrasaurus dongpoensis. Oh, it's interesting he changed the species name. Yes. He changed his mind in the meantime. Well, the species name changed again because ensis is only used to refer to localities, so they use the I or the E suffix instead to refer to a male individual, and that's how we got Abrasaurus dongpoi. Which looks a little bit funny reading it as an English speaker because it looks like dongpoi, because mm -hmm. the O and I sort of are combined. That's where you have to know how these Latin suffixes work. Mm-hmm. The holotype's a nearly complete, well-preserved skull. A fragmentary skull and skeleton have also been found, but hasn't been described. Oh, so I guess you can kind of guess then how it looks from that. It had a lightly built skull that was considered to be, quote, delicate and graceful. Hui described Abrasaurus as a, quote, moderate-sized sauropod with a delicately constructed skull. He also said it had extremely large fenestra in the skull the holes, the openings, and the skull was relatively low and elongated. The openings in the skull are similar to Camarasaurus, but the skull of Camarasaurus is more robust. Abrasaurus had these narrow, elongated nasals that were about one-third the length of the skull. Yeah, big nose. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, that's true. <laughs> he also had a lot of teeth that were spoon-shaped. Originally, Abrasaurus was described as a Camarasaurid, but that may not actually be the case. Some later research found it to be a basal member of Macronaria, like Camarasaurus, but we still need more research, such as the description of the second specimen, to be more certain. Yeah, it's nice they have a second one. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Especially, like you said, for knowing the length. Yeah. Abrasaurus is housed at the Tsugong Dinosaur Museum, and other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place included stegosaurs, such as Bashanosaurus, and Huayengasaurus, sauropods such as Shunosaurus, and Omeisaurus, and theropods such as Lashansaurus and Yangchuanosaurus. And other animals that lived around the same time and place included crocodiliforms, pterosaurs, and turtles. All right, Garrett, tell me about your fun fact and sexual dimorphism. <laughs> All right. So my claim is that ankylosaurs may have had different sized tail clubs and more or less armor depending on if they were male or female. The armor too. Yes. So if their tail clubs were used for sexual selection, the sex that's battling it out is obviously going to need a bigger club and potentially they would need more armor to defend themselves against said club. Hmm. As we know, you know, they're breaking off osteoderms and stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't have a really good example of sexual dimorphism in non-avian dinosaurs. We have tons of them in avian dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, we can see them. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you look at birds, the biggest difference tends to be there's a little bit of size. And then a lot of times the males are more colorful. That's very common with birds. Yep. But if you're talking about fossilization. You can't see the colors really. Yeah, exactly. So there's a little bit of a difference in the size maybe, but you're not getting any of these colors, which are the really noticeable and really big feature. When you look at birds today, mm -hmm. everybody birding, you're looking at the colors to figure out male versus female. You're not looking at slight differences in size. Yeah. I think one of the examples that comes to mind is ducks. Or peacocks. Yeah. There, yeah, a lot of examples. It's been proposed many, many, many times. <laughs> Sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. I feel like we'd never go a month without a new paper where someone says, and this could be sexual dimorphism. So some of the examples, like different types of ways we might be able to see it, is you might be able to see it with different sizes. For example, females being larger than males. We might be able to see it with display structures like different colored feathers. That's actually a possibility now, thanks to some of the chemical analysis and melanosomes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll finally find a bird-like dinosaur. Some of those examples in China, we have hundreds of specimens of. That should be enough, right? That's a very large statistical sample where you could subset this chunk have this melanosome and this subset have this melanosomes. It's possible. And we could also maybe see it with weapons. For example, the horns on ceratopsians, we know that they were battling it out because we see the scratch marks on the frills. But unfortunately, with the horns on ceratopsians, they're proposed as unique features for the species and then also potentially combat structures. So they're a little bit confounded where we use the horns to define a ceratopsian as a specific genus. And then we're also trying to say, oh, it might relate to the sex of the dinosaur, it makes it really tricky because then it's like, well, is it a new sex or is it a new species? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to say. And chylosaurs, however, have a better chance, I think, with their weaponry. And that's because usually with ankylosaurs, we tell the species apart by looking at the head and the different features of the little plates on the head and the horns around the head. Mm -hmm. And the differences in the club are usually not included in the species selection. So it's very possible that we could find a couple of heads that match. So we think they're the same species and then see differences in the clubs or the armor. Oh, and that's how we figure it out. Yes. Although I should say Victoria Arbor doesn't think this is likely. She even mentioned that in oh. the most recent paper. But I'm a little more optimistic. As backup to my optimism, sexual dimorphism has been proposed with a glyptodont. Those are those huge overgrown armadillos with a solid carapace and a stiff tail we've talked about a few times before. I think they're the most recent ankylosaurus-like animals. They lasted until at least the Pleistocene, 11,000 years ago. Could have lasted even longer. Some people think there's a different glyptodont that lasted until 7,000 years ago, which is very recent. That is recent. That's almost as recent as that poet. <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> With the glyptodont glyptotherium, there has specifically been proposed sexual dimorphism. That's a North American glyptodont that lived about 4 million years ago, a little bit longer ago. They found a mother and its unborn baby fossilized together. Hmm. And glyptodonts are placentals, so they give live birth. And so obviously that's very useful because you can see the baby inside the animal. Mm -hmm. You can tell that it's a female and that gives you your little Rosetta stone for, okay, here's the female skeleton. And it also gave us a baby to work with, which was handy. Yeah, because sometimes animals change a lot while they grow up. Exactly. So it helped us to see what were those changes as they grew up versus we could now compare this large one that we knew was a female and an old enough female to reproduce. So pretty well developed compared to the other glyptodonts around, and we found some differences. Something that's kind of interesting, though, is that we may only ever know for sure if, if an animal was female, yeah, not male. That's very true, yeah, because we have found some dinosaurs that have those eggs stuck mm -hmm. inside them, and so you can say for sure it's a female, because yeah. males don't get eggs stuck inside them. I was thinking, <laughs> because if this glyptodont with the baby was found with another glyptodont, you would have no idea if that other glyptodont was male or female. Like if, you know, if for some, oh, if there was like parental care with both of them. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like next to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That doesn't tell you anything. That's true. It has to be inside. Yeah. <laughs> and then you only get that with the females. 
The interesting thing too is that even though there were differences in the teeth and jaws and osteoderms, the teeth and jaws seemed like they were probably due to it growing up, like the angle of the jaw and some of the details change. The osteoderms, however, look like they might be the most useful feature for determining whether a glyptodont or a glyptotherium specifically was male or female. They said, quote, small osteoderms that are ankylosed, on the other hand, are probably female and large osteoderms that are ankylosed, ankylosed, <laughs> I always want to say ankylosed, <laughs> are probably male, end quote. As a side foot fact, ankylos is a verb and it's pronounced ankylos, sort of like the alternate pronunciation for ankylosaurus. <laughs> oh. And in this case, it's the, the glyptodonts, osteoderms fusing together. Because that's what ankylosis is. It's when bones fuse together. I feel like you always have multiple fun facts nested in your fun fact. (laughs) Yeah, there's little offshoots to the Erected Railway S burrow. (laughs) So basically the summary there is that male glyptodonts have larger and sometimes conical osteoderms, especially near the base of the tail. That species was called Glyptotherium arizonae. I bet you can guess where it was found. (laughs) Texas. No, that's Glyptotherium texanum. (laughs) And since Glyptotherium texanum is the type species, and the only difference are these osteoderms that seem to be sexual selection, that means that Glyptotherium arizonae is just a male Glyptotherium texanum. Mm. So they got synonymized. Now it's just Glyptotherium texanum. There is another species, but that's a different story. Glyptotherium, unfortunately, did not have a club on the end of its tail, so there isn't anything we can say about the club and how it changed. There is a later glyptodont named Dodicurus, also Didicurus, depending on how you want to pronounce it, which was in Argentina and Uruguay. The fossils of its club have big depressions in them, which might have actually had huge spikes growing out of them when they were alive. Ooh. Speaking of maces, yeah, (laughs) there's actually art way back in 1913 that shows a pair of them and only one of them has a tail club. And I'm presuming that they were probably thinking of sexual dimorphism back then because it's a popular thing to notice. And it has been proposed that with Dodicarus, the males may have used their tails for intraspecific competition and that fractures in their carapaces seem to line up with where you'd expect them to bash each other. Just like Zool. Yeah, exactly. It's just like those broken osteoderms. They also said that presumably, if that was the case, the males would have been more heavily armored than the females. And based on what we see with glyptotherium, that may be the case, right? Because the male glyptotheriums have more robust, bigger osteoderms. But unfortunately, we don't have a pregnant dodicarus like we do with glyptotherium to help us figure this out. At least not yet. Yeah, exactly. You never know. Yep. Or there might be something else we can find that will nail it down. Or we might find it with an ankylosaur. Yeah. Ultimate win. That'd be nice. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you want to read more about the stories that we covered, then check out our show notes at inodino.com. Thanks again. And until next time. Good day.